This program is intended for informational and educational purposes only. All views and opinions expressed are the views and opinions of the individuals and sponsors presenting them, and not the LTB network. Enjoy the show. This is Sex and Science Hour with Brian Sovereign and Dr. Stephanie Murphy. Get your freak on. This is Sex and Science Hour. Welcome to the show. Yeah. I think we're on episode 17. Is that right, Brian? That sounds about right. We keep kind of getting a little bit later each week. (laughs) I hope nobody like expects it to be out on a certain day. it's, It's like the first rule of podcasting is be consistent. You know, have a day of the week where you put out your show. We have not really been adhering to that for the last couple of weeks, but... Well, like well, when the Titanic... <laughs> you're getting a free yeah. podcast, so... <laughs> when the Titanic came into port in New York, you know, a few years ago, it was better late than never, right? Better late than never, yes. I like that motto. Of course, that's from Ghostbusters too. but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So, Brian, we have a lot to talk about today, including an article that I was really excited about. You found this, and you said we got to talk about this on Sex and Science Hour. So here we are talking about it. For, the, for all the times that anyone has said, but who will build the roads... Has anyone, have you ever heard anyone say, but, but who will lay down the fiber? Oh, who yeah. will build the internet? Essentially, who would, I mean, or who would, uh, you know, who would regulate it? Who would, uh, oh, who would, who, why would, yeah, how would we have internet without government? Yeah. So yeah, people because, actually say that, huh? Oh, sure. And, and it's certainly true that, I mean, unlike roads, as to where roads were originally, at least in this country, were originally designed by private individuals. Uh, yes, they were, and they were maintained by private individuals, and some still are. We yeah. actually, we actually know some people that have uh, quite an extensive driveway, and they like it's a dirt driveway. They grade mm-hmm. it, they put lay down gravel every year, and they get together with their neighbors and they pitch in to do it themselves. Yeah, but no amazingly, they, yeah, amazingly, they don't hire the government to repair those driveways. You know, I mean, it's yeah. Just, can you imagine if they did? Yeah, so it wouldn't uh, work out too well. <laughs> so if someone does need to build the roads, I guess we could just find the people that actually take care of those huge driveways, but. But uh, anyway, <laughs> so but yeah, you know, it's tr- unlike that. Uh, it is true that the Internet was invented by the government. Uh, that is an accurate statement. There are a lot of people, libertarians or whatever persuasion that want to say that it wasn't. No, it most certainly was invented by the government. Uh, so, yeah. So a lot of people, you know, their their claim is certainly a lot better than was it Al Gore. Yeah, right. It was Al Gore. <laughs> I invented the no, Internet. Seriously, was it Al Gore? Because he claims that he did, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't yeah, him, no, right? No, 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 no. There, okay. Yeah, it, it was a military <laughs> Just deal. Just checking. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of people uh, would would make that claim, of, and they'd have more claim to it than they would with the roads, because people do build roads without governments. Well, in this case, there is a German village where they have actually made, they've created their own internet infrastructure Without the help of any government, just completely uh, peer-to-peer, totally, um, you know, a grassroots project. Did you? You yeah. obviously heard about this. Yeah. But. No, I mean, come on. Clearly, all they did was they laid down some, uh, you know, they laid down some phone line and maybe attached to something. They didn't do a whole lot. It's not like they're getting great speeds that well, are actually, actually faster. Actually, they laid down their own fiber optic cable, and greater than ninety percent of the people in the town voluntarily contributed to it wait hold on so you're telling me they have this little tiny village in germany has better internet than the united states than the bulk of the united states yeah it's hard to believe huh and and not only that (laughs) but somehow they agreed they all agreed with no government intervention that they wanted it and that they all pretty much laid down money for it and i bet the other eight percent or however many people that didn't contribute to it uh, are still reaping the benefits from, benefits from it, and nobody cares <laughs> that they didn't pay in. Yeah, well, you want to know what happened? This is, this is unbelievable. This does. This isn't real. You think this you're saying happen. RT is making this up for, the, it, it, it for their libertarian it agenda? Can, yeah, it, it cannot be true. There's no way that people can possibly agree 
to do something good for a village without government. That's not possible. <laughs> well, apparently they did. Here's what happened. Inhabitants of a small village in Germany have taken the digital law into their own hands. They laid their own fiber optic cables, setting up their own broadband network after being told their village was too small and remote by telephone companies. When internet service providers and telephone companies told residents of Lowenstein it. <laughs> in northern Germany that they were too small and irrelevant to warrant a decent decent internet service. They just decided oh, to do it themselves. Boy, if that doesn't prove the two wolves and the sheep, you know, <laughs> it's like, no, look, you're too small to matter. Yeah. You, are you, so you're talking about democracy, right? right. Where the, the needs of yeah smaller interests get ignored because they get drowned out by the majority or whatever. Right. Right. Yeah. That, it sounds like that's clearly exactly what happened here. Um, the the mayor said we would have never found a company willing to supply the necessary f- uh, fiber optics. So the villagers set up their own company, their own broadband network, and even laid down the cable themselves. It's nothing new to people here to do things for themselves, uh, said a one of five local women who ran Burger Breitband Nets Citizens <laughs> Broadband <laughs> Network, the company that the villagers set up. Um, her name is Sabine Burkett. This is about preserving a culture and a way of life. These villages would, n- would not survive without a broadband connection. First of all, they worked out how much they'd need to raise and came to the figure of 2.5 million euros, which is about $3.4 million. That's not a small sum of money. This meant at least 68% of Lohen, Lohenstedt residents had to sign up for the scheme for it to be viable. Each her- person had to pay in at least 1,000 euros into the company, $100 to become a shareholder, and another $900 as a loan. None of the villagers were forced to join the scheme, but in the end, 94% put down cash. They managed to get... Ninety four percent. And and this this um, network is apparently geared up to reach twenty two thousand homes. Yeah, this is actually really, really well done. So like, that's a lot of people that they got to pay in. Ninety four percent voluntarily ponied up a thousand euros. Yeah, it's, that's almost two thousand dollars. I mean, what do you think they were paying in taxes? Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not good enough. But I mean, you know, I can just picture what people will say. It's like, well, of course, 94 percent of people could agree on something that is so important to our modern world as having Internet access. But yes, that's the point is that people will build their own. You know, they, they the services they need, they will build their own if there is no one else around to do it. You know what I mean? If yeah. there is no hospital, believe me, they'll build a hospital. Yeah, there's clearly a need for internet, just like there is need for hospital. Sure, maybe not it's... quite as severe, but uh, <laughs> no, but <laughs> it depends. You know, sometimes you do feel like you're going to die if you don't have a connection. But uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now I'm curious. I mean, I'm curious why they chose to actually lay down fiber instead of maybe just putting up some kind of broadband tower or something where people could get 3G. You know, where they wouldn't have had to actually lay down cables oh, yeah i mean and, and that's interesting too because laying out a setting up a tower uh would actually be incredibly inexpensive in fact this inexpensive. was inexpensive inexpensive yep. because this was a, a really a business opportunity uh quite a, a, about a decade ago in the united states was to set up you know cell towers and 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 3g tower or not 3g but to set up wireless towers essentially uh and so it's not it's not an expensive prospect to do i'm guessing they ran into some legal troubles mm. with the matter oh perhaps uh, cuz yeah, yeah they, the government sometimes don't want towers being put up like right. here in new hampshire they try to actually pathetically try to disguise them as trees and it's obvious that it's not yeah. a tree it's a cell phone <laughs> tower cuz it's a first of all it's it's way taller than all the other trees right. second of all it looks totally fake it's like painted right. brown and green and it's like come on we know that's not a tree <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> don't even try <laughs> don't even pretend uh <laughs> yeah but i just i think this story is so beautiful yeah it's cool and they actually you know unlike ta- attacks where they're just throwing you know a thousand euros down the hole they're actually getting a return on their investment because right. it's a loan to the company it's a it's a company and they're making a loan to the company and they're basically investing in this company right and they're going to get a, a return back yeah, and, and this is high-end stuff. This isn't backwater implementations of uh, communications. This is, you know, this is the latest and greatest mm. that they're getting. They're getting better than most of the United States of America. Mm. And they did it without government. In fact, they did it, to, you know, to give the finger to government, saying, <laughs> yes, oh, yeah, totally we're too did. small for you. 
We'll show you. <laughs> I, I just I think it's fantastic. Uh, yeah, I think so too. And I mean, we do have another story we wanted to talk about in this segment, which is a little shorter than normal because the second segment of the show is going to be longer, Ooh. bigger, longer, bigger, longer, uncut. extended, uncut, maybe cut. <laughs> but apparently, this is a problem all over Germany. There's only about 18 percent of Germans who have internet connections with speeds up to 10 me- megabytes per second or more. So wow. Yeah, but I mean, it's funny because Germany is pretty like. It's known for technology. Yeah, but yeah, yet, oh, it's one of the major hubs of uh, of hacktivism of hackers. Yeah, but like it, apparently, maybe there's a lot of rural rural places where not many people have internet. So yeah, they, well, these villagers have totally solved the problem. Hats off to them; they've done it voluntarily. I love it. If you wanted to, you could opt out, but most people choose chose to participate, and that is so cool. But without government, without, <laughs> what will we do? Uh, we'll just do it ourselves. Well, to contrast against this, here's another story that I thought was really interesting. This is coming out of Wired. There's a study that shows, and this is by Andy Greenberg. He's um he's pretty cool, I think. Um, there's a study that shows that the Silk Road actually reduced violence in the drug trade. And they've actually um, quantified this and put put numbers on it. I can absolutely believe that. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes total sense. So I guess if if anybody is listening to this show, you know, we've got listeners from all over the place. So I don't know what people's level of familiarity is with the Silk Road, but basically it was a online marketplace, was because it got shut down um, last October. Right. Uh, it was an online marketplace where people could essentially mail order different types of drugs. Sure. And I guess there were other things on there. There was some, you know, like... Even legal things, memorabilia, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, you could get all kinds of things. I love the banned books section. Yeah, and there are banned books today yeah. in the in the world. Um, but anyway, so most of the traffic, I think, on the Silk Road was people mail ordering drugs. Sure. And you know, I never actually went on it. Like, I never even looked at it. But I heard a lot of um, reports from people who were curi- journalists who were curious looked at it, or people who actually bought drugs on the Silk Road. And of course, you could do this all with Bitcoin. That's the tie-in to Bitcoin here. Yeah, I mean, I I, I used it. I did not. I'm not interested in drugs mm-hmm. at all. Uh, but I did use it, and it was incredibly efficient and simple. Did you buy a banned book? I bought a banned book. Seriously? Yeah, I did. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. Oh, this was some time ago. Wow. Oh, you you yeah. scoff. Just, just a PDF. You I outlaw. mean, it, it was probably something I could have downloaded, but huh. I wanted to try it. I wanted so it to was, know. So it was a digital delivery. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah, it was so awesome. So did you have a good experience with it? It was phenomenal. Wow. It was, it was great. Interesting. Well, so you were not the uh, majority of the use cases, Brian. You, That's you're, true. You were buying banned books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was the banned book? I'm just curious. Uh, let's see. It was a pack, actually, okay. uh, where it came with like 10 books. Okay. And I I don't know if I want to say the names. Okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll say that the... That the letters J E and C A C exist within some of them, and I'm not going to go any I have further. Than no that. idea what that's you're okay. talking Just about, but that's it. okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so a lot of people bought drugs on the Silk Road, and you know. A lot of people have made the argument just from a phil- philosophical standpoint that it's way safer if you can, from the comfort of your own home, order a package that contains whatever drug you are using. And get it delivered to you rather than have to go out carrying cash on some street corner or whatever, deal with a person face to face who might rob you or might beat you up or whatever, or might, you know, who knows what they could do. They could screw you over. They could give you an inferior product. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the Silk Road, it's almost like eBay where people were competing on the basis of purity and cost and, um, you know, safety of their products. Right. So people, uh, it seems pretty obvious to me that they were getting a safer experience like if someone's going to use drugs and if we're going to talk about harm reduction no you know people are not going to s- stop using drugs no matter how much some people might want them to no laws never stop anything if laws worked people wouldn't steal anymore they still do <laughs> especially people wearing blue and green costumes right <laughs> uh, anyway um yeah but it's it's a fantasy to think that no one's going to use drugs people are going to use yes. illegal drugs and so why not focus on reducing the harm in that process yeah. you know and it, not not having them exposed to potential violence or uh, theft or 
substances of inferior quality. Yeah, and creating the anonymity that the Silk Road allowed for is really what allowed for that safer environment. And it also created, because it was such an open marketplace, it allowed for testing kits to get sold, all kinds of things to where mm-hmm. people knew they were getting the good stuff. Absolutely, yeah. It, you can read this article for yourself. We'll put it in our show notes here. But this paper actually said having good customer service and writing skills was more important than muscles and face-to-face connections in this world of drug dealing. How Fascinating stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, we're going to talk about a weighty issue here on Sex and Science Hour coming up. Stay tuned. It's time for the podcast within a podcast to report on our weekly tips and Amazon shopping that has been done through our Sex and Science Hour Amazon links. I'm actually going to break this up into two parts because there were so many cool items purchased on Amazon and so many sexy items. I don't know if people can take it all at once, so I'm going to break it into two and you'll have to listen to both of them to see what people got that was so darn sexy. First of all, thank you so much. We did receive a couple tips this week, as always. We usually get a few each week, and it is so cool to have little bits of Bitcoin coming in and know that people are listening and they appreciate our show. That is just the coolest feeling in the world. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. If you want to send us a tip, you can always click the links in our blog post. There's a little tip widget, and then there are also just addresses. So if you use CryptoKit or you copy and paste, you can do that too. And you don't have to just tip us in Bitcoin. We've got other cryptocurrency tip addresses too. So make use of whichever one is your favorite there. And we thank you so much. And as far as our Amazon shopping list this week, oh, it was very interesting. In case you're not familiar, we do have some affiliate links for Amazon US, Canada, and UK. By the way, if you want a different country that's not listed, you can always email us and we'll put it in. But basically, we can see what people buy through the links. We can't see who bought it. We can just see what was bought. So that leaves us to wild speculation about what you kinky freaks are doing with these things that you purchase on Amazon. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> So what were people shopping for this week on our Sex and Science Hour Amazon links? We'll start out with the tame, the mundane, perhaps. We had what looked like a couple of sets of plaque pickers, although they said they were not for dental use, so I can only imagine what somebody was doing with those. Protective headphones, a wrench, and hex keys. What is somebody doing with all these tools? Are they building wax statues? Are they doing some other kind of work? Who knows? But I hope they're having fun, whatever they're doing with it. We also had a couple of hard drives, a headphone splitter, and a pair of binoculars. Ooh, the better to spy on you with, as well as some Energizer batteries to go all night. In the food department, we had some very sexy foods, artichoke cream, asparagus cream, and chocolate. Fancy that. So we need to get back to the show right now, but stay tuned for part two later in this episode. And thank you again so much. Now back to Sex and Science Hour. This is Sex and Science Hour. Welcome back to the show. I'm Stephanie. You're Brian, right? Of course. (laughs) Okay, I said we were going to talk about a weighty issue in the second segment here. And we've actually got four stories to cover, so we'll see if we get to them all. Are we going to talk about lead? No, although that's a good guess because lead is one of the densest uh, substances, yeah, it's right? Heavy, some heavy metal. <laughs> heavy metal. Rock on! Yeah. <laughs> so um, apparently, we've reached a, a point, a milestone, if you will, in the health of the world, where nearly one third of the world's population is overweight. Ouch. Yeah. Now, it's kind of interesting to think about that, because if you think about the definition of overweight, you know, essentially, if somebody wanted to, they could change the definition of what is overweight, and they could then suddenly, you know, hundreds of thousands of people become overweight, even though their actual physical weight has not changed. It's just that the definition, now they are included in the definition of overweight. And this is something that has been done in the past with blood pressure, diabetes, you know, it used to be that... You know, 120 over 80 was a normal blood pressure. And if you had above 140 or something like that, uh, what is it, the systolic or the diastolic, the top number, uh, (laughs) if you had over 140, then you had high blood pressure, but then they moved it down to 135. And then suddenly overnight, hundreds of thousands of people who were kind of on the borderline of high blood pressure suddenly became hypertensive, even though their blood pressure didn't actually change. So I agree that there's something in there about definitions. But regardless, it sounds like 
you know, the definition of overweight hasn't really changed. I think it's been pretty consistent for quite a while. Yeah, well, I mean, like, there's, okay, there's issues kind of with this. There are, yeah. It's based on body mass index, right, which is a ratio of your height height to weight. And it's for people with different genetic backgrounds, it's different. You know, um, like yeah, that's that's the thing is like I remember in school, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they had the presidential fitness program in the U.S. And that essentially said that, you know, if you were I'm six foot one. OK. Mm-hmm. And if I didn't weigh 180 pounds, then I was overweight. Right. That's ridiculous. Mm. OK. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know when I ever weighed 180 pounds and I've been a fit guy, you know, over and over in my life. Oh, yeah. You and probably so, have under, you know, Maybe around ten percent body fat. It's sure, not, not very high. Right, but it's very difficult for me to get to. I mean, I can do one one ninety, you know. But even then, muscle starts packing on, turns into about two hundred, mm-hmm. and goes higher. So, uh, you know, it's tough to 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 really say what actually works. Is I mean, individuals and are different. The, They're individuals. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And in yeah. their definition, like it it is hard. Like perhaps body fat percentage would be a better measure of how fat someone is, like mm-hmm. their fatness, literally, right. uh, how much of their how much of their body composition is lipids or fat. Yeah, we're not saying fat. We're we're saying literally fat. Yeah, like, like the definition. <laughs> we're not calling anyone yeah, fat. we're, we're just saying we're fat, saying fat <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as opposed to protein or water or right. bone or whatever. Exactly. But uh, maybe that would be a better measure, and it would correlate more with health. But it's really difficult. It's like notoriously difficult to measure body fat percentage. It's difficult for sure. people to do at home. So it's kind of easier to take a ratio of height to weight, but it has its problems. But in their defense, it is really challenging to uh, write a definition of weight that encompasses or that correlates with somebody's health. And in fact, there have been numerous studies that have come out that say, actually, people who are overweight, not obese, but overweight. So like normal weight is, I think, a body mass index of 19 to 25. Right. I was going to say it's under 30. Yeah. Yeah. Overweight is 25 to 30. And then obese is 30 plus. And then they actually have different categories of obese. So there's like obese one, obese two, obese three, obese four. (laughs) So you can be like different levels and gradations here. But um, there have actually been studies that have come out that say people who fall into the overweight range with a body mass index between 25 and 30. So overweight, but not obese. Right. Live longer. Right. Than people of normal weight. So that's a big problem. <laughs> wow. Because I mean, c- like the, what they say is that, oh, well, it's correlated with um, how wealthy they are. So like if somebody is a, has a high standard of living, they're likely to have a less physical job and they're they're going to be more likely to be overweight and they have access to better health care because they're rich. And that means that's why they're fat. Well, and they're, that's... that's why they're overweight and that's why they're they live longer a good chunk of the world that might still be true um i think the you know the 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 rich or the more wealthy the more well off at least in the u.s are generally the more fit people Mm -hmm. but certainly in in the u.s you know 100 years ago obesity was actually something you looked for in a person okay yeah, because it means it, they can afford all the food they exactly need, right? it meant they were well to do you mm-hmm. know as to where now it's actually the antithesis at least in this country or at least in the continent mm. uh, that the more well to do seem to be the ones that have the time to exercise and whatever else yeah um so here are some of the findings from this um, study that says that a third of the world's population is overweight more than 50 percent of the 671 million obese live in 10 countries so it's mostly just that i think i've i think i've seen studies in the u.s that say two-thirds of the population is at least overweight if not obese right so there's only like one-third that's normal weight or less right yeah uh, so but 50 percent of the world's 671 million obese live in 10 countries uh which the highest rates of obesity, this is from most obese to least obese, are U.S., China, India, Russia, Brazil, Mexico, Egypt, Germany, Pakistan, and Indonesia. Wow. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting that at least now there's some degree of numbers mm-hmm. to prove the point, I guess. But, yeah. but I think most people can really just walk outside and kind of look around and just say, yeah, yeah. There, there's, it's you know, prevalent. This, is, this is prevalent. It, it is prevalent. And is it a problem, though, you know? Is it is it a sign of increasing standards of living around around the world? Uh, you know. Well, okay, yeah. See, now you raise an interesting point, and please, I'm not. If someone's overweight, 
you know, there's so many reasons why that could be. Oh, yeah. And I empathize wholeheartedly. I've been overweight in my Me life. Me too. I get Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You know, so so please don't don't take any offense. Um, but there is a difference between two between two phrases. One is standard of living. The other is quality of life. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very true that the standard of living is rising throughout the world. Mm-hmm. But that does not equate to quality of life. Mm-hmm. Okay, standard of living, yeah, that's great. Everybody can take a shower. You know, there's more readily access, uh, accessibility to food and all this other stuff. Mm. That's fantastic. But does that does all that mean? Does being able to get Doritos equal having a greater quality of life? Right. Are there just suddenly a bunch of people who used to be so poor that they were starving or that they couldn't really afford a lot of food, and who have now been able to who have now been able to move on to or quote move up to being able to access kind of junk food that's not that nutritious but might right. put weight on them you know right yeah sure certainly and it and maybe that's what it is um you could talk about the reasons why but this is a fact now it's been shown by a study so yeah and it's something to consider and do with I, and, that whatever you would whatever you would like yeah i mean and i and i give people being proud you know that hey no i can go and get this and i can eat whatever i want and you know and i'm i'm enjoying life mm. but I, I i i encourage people to reconsider that idea of standard of living versus quality of life mm. well maybe one of the reasons why people are so overweight around the world is that uh, people are multitasking more and food apparently tastes bad while multitasking. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about this. And, uh, <laughs> I thought those were good a good pair of articles to talk about together. There's a, a piece here we got from Scientific American saying that uh, another study has shown that if you eat while distracted, the food actually tastes more bland. It mm. doesn't have much of a flavor. So according to um, a recent review of 24 studies, so this is like a meta-analysis in the American Journal of... Um, published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, which is a pretty good journal. Um, Food, eating while distracted, is known to cause overindulgence, and it uh, dampens our perception of taste, causing us to eat more. Yeah, I I can believe it. You know, I am actually... Ironically, because just years ago, of course, the, the multitasking, like real multitasking that computers kind of allow for, mm-hmm. is kind of a newer phenomenon, maybe 10, 12 years, if that, maybe 15. And, you know, I would have, if you asked me a few years ago, you know, I would have been so proud of my ability to multitask. Mm. It's like, oh, you have no idea how many things I'm doing, man. Give me a more powerful computer because I want to do more at once, <laughs> you know, have so much going on. Uh I have gotten, I, in my own personal life, I've gone the exact reversal. Yeah. I want, in fact, one of the things I love Chromebooks for is that they really only do one thing at a time. Mm-hmm. In I some like ways, that. it can be really draining emotionally and just in terms of your energy to just be doing all these different things at once. And you kind of feel like you're not actually getting anything done because your energy is, is scattered towards all these different tasks. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's ironic. And I don't think this article said this, but there is an old there, there's some old wisdom, you know, uh, I don't, whatever you want to call it. That was that was given to me when I was young, long before I think multiple multitasking was even an idea it might not have even been a word yet okay and that was if you combine talking and eating you'll end up doing neither very well <laughs> okay and this is old this you'll is hundreds of years old people with the food in your yeah, mouth <laughs> yeah so but how true yeah that when you multitask you don't end i mean like especially while eating yeah you, you don't eat well yeah. And that's exactly what this is saying. So that's fascinating. It, it seems really, like people knew. It really is true. I mean, there's such a great temptation to check your email or read something or whatever while while eating. But at the same time, the, it, the food is more satisfying and you you are more aware of what you're actually eating yeah. than if you are doing something else at the same time. In, this, in one of these studies here, the, this article says there were four experiments. Participants attempted to memorize either a seven-digit number which is a heavy load on the brain, or one digit number, a light load, a cognitive load, while tasting salty, sweet, and sour substances and rating each food's taste intensity. In all experiments, participants under the heavy cognitive load rated each type of taste as less intense, and they also ate more of the sweet and salty substances. Wow. Yeah. So I don't know if checking your email during lunch qualifies as a heavy cognitive load, but... It could. 
in yeah, some instances, it, especially if you're reading an email that's causing feelings to come up or like you're you're panicked because you're like, oh, I have to get this done before I, you know, finish my lunch break or whatever. Right. 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 Yeah, I, I could definitely see that. Um, I mean, and you don't even like think about that you're eating and you might even forget how much you ate if you're like the kind of person that wants <laughs> yeah. to keep track of what they're eating or whatever. I'm not that kind of person, but some people are. You and... know, it, it's so it's so interesting that you mention it. Sorry, go ahead. Finish no, no, please. No. Well, there have been a lot of studies that come out that say if you ask people to estimate or to like repeat back what they ate over the day, they believe they ate actually 30% more food than they believe that they ate. Yeah, and that's incredibly I've, consistent. I've heard that. <laughs> yeah. You know, it just, it goes to show, I mean, I, I really, I think, especially in our multitasking world, which is what we're talking about, mm-hmm. um, the lack of attention you know, is, is just, I really, I, some people say, no, it's not, it's not a problem. We're just evolving or something. No, I think it's a problem. Mm -hmm. I think we have an attention span issue. We're Uh, probably not adapted for it. No, no, we're not. And, and I think that that is actually really, I think that lack of attention to yourself, you know, is, is going away and like paying attention Paying attention to what you eat is important. Paying attention to everything. I mean, is it good for your mental health, your physical health? Your, your entire health, I think, really comes down to paying attention mm. to what's going on. And yeah, and, and clearly, I mean, food tastes like crap if you're not paying attention. <laughs> yeah, this is one of those scientifically um, backed up right. kind of weight loss tips or whatever, right. <laughs> right? That if you actually chew your food more and like pay attention and really like savor the sensation of eating then you will end up eating less. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of uh, speaking of lack of attention, Brian, this is an article that you haven't seen yet, but I want to get your reaction to it. I couldn't believe this. I thought it was The Onion when I first saw the headline, but it's actually real. And it's backed up by apparently oh, a boy. degree of research. Hurricanes with female names end up killing more people because people don't respect them or take them seriously. What study finds? <laughs> uh, oh, all right, what, what's the sample size? What's the this is <laughs> so okay? So this is from the Washington Post. People don't take hurricanes as seriously if they have a feminine name, and the consequences are deadly. Oh, I don't, a- I don't trust Jeff Bezos. This is Amazon taking over the world. He owns Washington. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was written about they're, in they're other places, reporting. too. I can yeah. find you another yeah, article. they're just reporting it. But, yeah, this was actually published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, otherwise known as PNAS, mm-hmm. which <laughs> <laughs> I like that, uh, the, just the name. But it's a pretty, you know, it's, it's not a bad journal. Sometimes it gets controversial oh, results uh, published in it. Yeah. Uh, of course, you know, a lot of st- scientific studies that make headlines are controversial. So there's that. But um, anyway, yeah. this is their study says um, this is from researchers at the University of Illinois and Arizona State University examined six decades of hurricane deaths, according to gender, spanning 1950 to 2012. Um, now, the way that hurricanes are named is they start off as a tropical storm, right? And then once yeah. they get reach a certain threshold of low pressure, they are upgraded to a hurricane, right? as I understand it. And hurricanes are named like the first tropical storm of the season starts out as A, mm-hmm. and then it moves on to B. And so they just go through the alphabet. Right. But and they, year, alternate, yeah. they alternate between male and female. So like if the first one is Andrew, the second one might be uh, Beth, and the third one might be Charlie, and the fourth yes. one might be Deirdre or something. So it's right. like male, female, male, female. And then, you know, that's when we get the names of hurricanes, like oh, Hurricane Katrina was a very famous one that killed a lot of people. Hurricane Rita, Hurricane Bob, Hurricane yep. Andrew, and Ivan so and forth. Charlie. Ivan and Charlie. I, I, I experienced those. They were in the same year. That, that was crazy. Oh, you were in Florida yeah, for Hurricane Yeah, I lived hurricane in Florida Ivan. at the time. Both of those were, those were pretty vicious. Wow. So people but did took, you get out? Like, did you leave? Did you evacuate? Uh, for... Ivan, I believe, is either Charlie or Ivan. I actually went up to Georgia. Mm, wow. So, yeah, because that, that one was really Would you bad. have gone if it was Hurricane Irene? It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, I mean, granted, like, I didn't care. You know, I mean, in, in hurricane areas, a lot of houses are made out of concrete concrete blocks like mm-hmm. in florida some of the nicest houses are made out of concrete blocks uh so i actually wasn't worried about it It was more the the family of the time that mm. i uh, moved away from okay so of the 47 most damaging hurricanes of the last 60 years the female named hurricanes produced an average of 45 deaths com- 
each, compared to 23 deaths in male-named storms, or almost double the number of fatalities if the, if the storm had a female name. It's, that's unbelievable. I... Although it did say that the study excluded Katri- Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Audrey, which they said were outlier storms that would have skewed the model. So I wonder if you put in the data mm. from Hurricane Katrina and Audrey, I mean, maybe it would have just totally invalidated their, <laughs> Because it sounds, yeah, like, they're kind Katrina, of, it like, sounds like they're kind of cherry-picking the data, you know? Sure, sure. It, it's interesting. I, I got to wonder about this. I mean, I could almost believe it, right? Like, if you saw... like here, Here's another study I'd love to see. See how people react to when a gun gets pointed at them and, the, and it's pink. Mm. I bet most people won't react you know in any i don't don't think they'd react as seriously i don't know if it would be ethical to do that study no it wouldn't be but but that's that's the point is that like i still certainly there is something to the degree that anything feminine is considered like equates weak like is that how deep people's biases go oh absolutely you you know this is something uh, i you know i i wonder okay there's more to this you want to hear yeah, please. there's a little bit more the the difference in death rates between genders was even more pronounced when they compared strongly masculine names versus strongly feminine ones and now i don't know what they would consider a strongly masculine or strongly feminine name but i'm guessing something like jesse or casey might be a more androgynous name because there right. it could be a man's or a woman's name you know what i mean So (laughs) they said that their model suggests, this is a quote from the study, our model suggests that changing a severe hurricane's name from Charlie to Eloise could nearly triple its death toll. Wow. Can you believe that? (laughs) I still... I mean, maybe, maybe maybe it's possible, you know? I'm shocked at that. Honestly, I am shocked at this. Yeah, I... (sighs) I just it's, if it's a bad hurricane, it's a bad freaking hurricane. It well, doesn't thing. matter I, what it's named. Yeah. See, because I wonder, like, are they judging the category? Because I mean, there's different there's different categories of hurricanes. Yeah. Okay. Supposedly, so, the names are assigned at random, or like the names are assigned when they don't know how bad it's going to be. Right, as but a that's storm. The, yeah, but then the categories are random too. Not like yeah, you know, it's random what a hurricane ends up becoming. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so if on the news suddenly you hear there's category five coming. You're getting out of there. I don't care what name it is. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so that's what I wonder is that if somehow just by chance, a lot of the female named hurricanes were just lower category. Yeah, I, I don't know. But I mean, that doesn't mean that I'm not saying that there isn't that deep ingrained. Well, there's another part of, to yeah, the study let's, let's that actually it. shows the what they would say was the sexist bias among people. Okay. So they actually surveyed people. They took um, they took like a, a few hundred people and they asked them hypothetical questions. Okay, there's a storm coming. It's named either Hurricane Brian or Hurricane Stephanie. Oh boy! <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, what do you do to prepare for it? And the respondents predicted male named hurricanes to be more intense than female hurricanes in an, in one exercise. In another exercise, the hurricane sex affected how responders said they would prepare. People imagining a, quote, female hurricane were not as willing to seek shelter. Yeah. The stereotypes that underlie these judgments are subtle and not necessarily hostile toward women. They may involve viewing women as warmer and less aggressive than men. Yeah. <sighs> But yeah, apparently see, there's a bias there, according, at least according to them. Sure. I, I could definitely see, again, there is a deep ingrained bias. I think there's a deep ingrained racism. There's a deep ingrained um, sexism. Oh, God. No, there, I'm just picturing is. like Hurricane Jamal or something. Like, what would yeah. people do? Oh. Hurricane Jose. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have a hard time believing that it's that statistically relevant. Mm. Have you? Yeah, I I'm a little skeptical of it too. But have you have you ever heard of the idea of um, uh, benevolent sexism? It's the idea that people people might have a nice sexist belief, but it's still sexist. So, for instance, they might think, well, women are just more c- nice and kind. You know, they're sweeter than men, or something like that. Or they might think, you know, yeah, men see, are. It's uh, that just seems too much like bene- bene- benevolent dictator. Which it's like, <laughs> oh wait a minute, so there's still a dictator, right? right. <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, I mean, the, the point of benevolent sexism, so called, is that it 
you know, it, there are studies that support its existence and it can still be harmful to people, yeah. even if they have a benevolent sexist belief against women or men or whatever. Right. It's like, you know, that's like forcing women to be more loving. Look, you don't have to, mm-hmm. you know, if someone's being wrong to, you know, if someone's wronging you. You don't have to keep on loving them because you're a woman. That's <laughs> yes. ridiculous. Absolutely. OK, so but you do have to keep on mining bitcoins if you are infected by a botnet. Oh, boy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you actually told me about this. Uh, it was over a week ago at this point mm-hmm. that you mentioned this. There's a popular game called Watch Dogs. Right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, this is a very popular game that just came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the, the new hot thing, okay. the new hot franchise. You know, it's a very open world uh, sandbox game that you can What's kind of do anything. Game? Sandbox means that you have you can kind of build whatever you want, do whatever you want. Okay. An open world means you can walk essentially wherever you want. Oh, cool! They would seem it would seem like an oxymoron to say open world sandbox, but it's not. Okay, so apparently this game was popular, and yep. it's as a popular game, it was getting uh, pirated copies. I hate to say pirated because it the negative connotations. I don't really have a, I don't really, I'm not in, you know, yeah. intellectual property is not a concept that I really am behind or no, any, in any way but, <laughs> so but pirated copies of this game have that's been, a colloquialism yeah have been appearing what would you call it copies of the game have been appearing on torrent sites what's the neutral way to say that i don't know that there is a neutral way okay got it yeah i know pe- certain people want to kind of control the language and then they end up controlling the ideas and the culture yeah. which is something that we talk about quite a bit but anyway so this game watchdogs appeared on torrent sites and people were downloading the torrent because they wanted to play the game and apparently that package had malware in it that m- made them part of a bitcoin mining botnet now this is not anything new this has happened before there have been lots of torrents that have infected people's computers with malware especially game related ones right there have been games that actually contain some kind of malware I- within the game that would mine bitcoins for somebody you know would yeah. make your computer part of a botnet the thing that i don't understand here is that how does it still make sense with the difficulty of the Bitcoin network going up and up, right? With so many people mining Bitcoins with mm-hmm. advanced hardware that's way more powerful than computer graphics cards, even with fast gaming computers. Right. It still it doesn't even come close to orders of magnitude below the, the most basic ASIC miner, right? The most basic ASIC, right? (laughs) ASICs are specialized hardware for mining Bitcoins. And computer graphics cards are just, they're so three years ago. Like It's been a while since it was profitable to mine Bitcoins on graphics cards. But apparently this person thought that if they had a big enough botnet, it would make sense. Yeah, maybe. I mean, or it, it comes down to why not? You know, because it's like, why not suppose, Why not shoot yeah. for it? I mean, it's easy enough to implement this sort of thing. Why not do it? Uh, and it's unfortunate because this was actually one of the popular uh, software pirates out there. Skid Row actually did this mm-hmm. or it was it was part of part of that torrent. And that's uh, that's that's a real shame. So but yeah, I agree. It's not really practical. But at the same time, it just becomes an issue of why not? If you can end up with, you know, if you get the luck of the draw, that somehow you just get one block of bitcoins. Is it worth it writing up that code Mm. for two days and inserting it into your torrent? Absolutely. You know, and And apparently a lot of people did download it before they they caught what was going on. Right. Yeah. And it's important to keep that in mind, too, that they decided to use the most popular game in the world right now. Mm. Which Watch Watchdogs certainly is the hottest. Maybe I shouldn't say popular, the hottest game in the world, and and it is certainly that. But this raises a really interesting point, and some people could get conspiratorial on this, but I'm not even thinking that way. Is that a lot of this? You know, a lot of I mean, pirating software has been so popular for so long. You know, you download it, you replace the exe file, and suddenly you have the full version of it. It's cracked, and you're good to go. And but I, I think this raises the question, you know, maybe that that needs to stop, you know, like that that pirating software is not a good thing. But this makes a case for using open source software. That way, pirating's not even really an issue mm. uh, because usually it's all free anyway. How much does this game cost if you were like to 60 bucks, 60 bucks? OK, yeah. Do you think people would buy it instead of torrenting it if it costs six dollars instead? Well, that see, now that's an that's a whole other conversation, mm-hmm. I think. But uh 
the ease what what happened is pirating games particularly became such an issue that somebody had to come up with a platform with an implementation to where people thought it was there was so much value to give money not just for the greatness of the game but for the ease of use and the ease uh, and and the features of having it and that happened steam came out mm -hmm. okay the, the the steam uh, you know software and that really made it i think people I think people will pay $60, even though you're not getting a physical box or disc anymore, because of all the features that Steam gives you with the game. Uh, so, yeah, if it costs 6 bucks, maybe it wouldn't have been pirated so much, but I still think, I can't, th there's, there's security things that people can do that cost less than $6 a month, that some people are just so damned cheap, <laughs> they won't pay for it. Right. Okay, and so I think that even if it was six dollars, people would still pirate this stuff. And there's the argument to make that pirating is a good way to demo a game you can try before you buy. Uh -huh. Okay, and that's all fine and dandy. That's nice. Um, you know, so but I don't think most people do that. About the idea of like some people are cheapskates. It may not even be that they're cheapskates. It may just be that there's no real like convenient, easy way to like pay. A dollar ninety nine for a song, or six dollars for a book, or whatever. Yeah, I think you're right. It makes a great, great case for Bitcoin. For Bitcoin, yeah, that's yeah. what exactly what I was thinking. So maybe we'll see that model more in the future. I think a lot of times it doesn't actually come down to the cost; it comes down to the ease of paying. Right. You know, like that's why. So apps, you know, like apps for Androids or iPhones or whatever. Mm -hmm. A lot of people buy purchase apps, especially in the Apple Store. Right. And it's probably because it's so easy. It's like they already have your credit card info on file. Oh, yeah. You don't need to do anything except click a button. So the cost becomes less of an issue when it's so easy and convenient to do that. Yeah. I mean, it's it's the old adage. You either spend money or you spend time. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and doing, you know, cracking the game and doing all and downloading it and all that stuff. And I'm not, I'm really not judging people that do that. I've done it in the past. Okay. Uh, you know, that takes a lot of time and effort. As to where just paying a buck for an app or five bucks for an app or even 13 bucks for an app uh, is instantaneous. You have it forever. It goes cross devices. I mean, it's phenomenal. Why wouldn't you pay for that? So you either it's it, again, it comes down to do you spend money or do you spend time? Mm. And but now it's becoming the case where there's more than just the lost amount of time and effort that comes into when you're doing this pirating stuff. It's actually becoming a real issue because now people are money can be made by writing scripts now mm. that do this sort of thing. Because yeah. it doesn't have to be Bitcoin. They could do it for, I don't know, take Doge. your pick. It could Litecoin. be Doge. Yeah. Anything. Yeah, absolutely. Anything so, they want, yeah. It makes an interesting case for using secure platforms like Steam and others. All right, well, coming up here, we're going to talk about coins and community and other listener emails. Stay tuned. Sex and Science out. So this is part two of what you all sexy people bought on Amazon through the Sex and Science Hour affiliate links this week. Let's get right back into it. So we've got a bike light, bike helmet, tire pump, chain, and jacket. And some kid got really lucky with a lot of Legos because <laughs> there were a bunch of Legos purchased this week too. We also got Three of these things, they're puzzles, they look like Rubik's Cubes on steroids. They are like 10 by 10 Rubik's Cubes, and they claim to be well lubricated on Amazon, <laughs> too. So hope whoever got those has fun uh, solving those puzzles. I wonder if they come with all the colors on the same face or if they come scrambled up and you have to solve it. Oh, well, that will leave us to wonder. In the books department, we had Anarcho SF, which is a collection of anarchist science fiction. In the DVDs department, Orange is the New Black, Continuum, The Hobbit, Wolf of Wall Street, and even Veronica Mars, the movie. And it looks like somebody was having a very sexy time because we had a supercharged, not just a regular charged, a supercharged bullet vibrator, anal beads, an inflatable butt plug, and a speculum. We also had a garter belt. Two kinds of thigh highs, including one that looks kind of like rainbow bright. They had these like rainbow things going around them. A few pairs of men's lace boy shorts. And the crowning glory, a men's power stretch lace bong thong. Thank you so much for using the Sex and Science Hour Amazon affiliate links. I hope everything that you got gives you great joy. 
And if you want to help us out and uh, maybe get some amusement out of hearing your items read on the show at a later date, you can always shop through those links too. They're right in our show notes found on letstalkbitcoin.com. Thank you so much. Now back to Sex and Science Hour. This is Sex and Science Hour. We are back. Blathering blather skites. <laughs> Usual third segment. Yeah, I got to come up with joy. another one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can do whatever you want, Brian. This is our show. It's That's our right. party. We can do whatever we want to. Yeah, no crying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, totally. No crying on this show. Uh, although we did kind of whine a couple of weeks ago about the Bitcoin community and some of our experiences just feeling like it's maybe not as fun as it used to be uh, with the addition of all these kind of, you know, just people that are in it to kind of make money and raise venture capital. Yeah, they're not there to change the world. They're not there to really like get us away from a lot of the uh, things that that I think a lot of people felt Bitcoin would free us from, you know, as a species. But I I don't want to sound like pompous, like I was there to change the world and you guys just suck or anything, because I don't know if I was even there to change the world, but I definitely just thought it was really cool and pretty libertarian. And that's it's getting less and less yeah. libertarian as time goes on, that's sure. for sure. Well, I think wanting to be libertarian, whether one agrees with that term entirely, uh, having that mindset is really one wanting to change the world because clearly you're not accepting the world as it is. Okay, that's a fair point. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. But anyway, so we talked about community on a, a show a couple of weeks ago, and a lot of people were like, what the hell happened to you guys? <laughs> you know, what, <laughs> what did you experience? So one person sent us hate mail and said, well, if you guys don't like the Bitcoin community, maybe you should just die and go to hell and something like that. Yeah, which is nonsense. We we love Bitcoin yeah. just fine. You, you know, it's just what a lot of people are wanting to do to it. Yeah, we were just kind of talking about our experience and, you know, we're not uh, we're not like stopping using Bitcoin or anything like that. We just kind of wanted to talk about what the direction it's going in. But we actually got an email from... Uh, Chris Joseph, who does the, he used to do the um, next podcast. Yeah, the next minute. I really enjoyed that. That was good stuff. Yeah, like it used to be in Let's Talk Bitcoin. I'm not sure if he's still doing it, but he did like he did a series of one minute podcasts. Now, I love I'm a big fan of short form podcasts like that. Yeah, like, yeah, it's fun. There's a podcast that you and I both love, Brian, called 90 Seconds on Sex. Yeah, I implement it on my show, Sovereign Tech, actually. Yeah, and you actually insert it into your podcast. Right. So it's a podcast within a podcast. Uh, and that one is by Dr. Paul Jonides. Yeah, he incredibly informative. So cool. Yeah, I, I love him. He wrote The Guide to Getting It On, which is one of the most fantastic, like, be- basic sex books. Like, if you're recently out or as, as gay, or if you're, like, dealing if you're anything like if you just want to know about sex like this the pleasure focused kind of sex education that you never got in school because none of us get it in school (laughs) (laughs) this is the book that you want to read it has pictures it's very cute should i say drawings matter of fact yeah it's got cartoons and they're 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 sexy but they're not like you know pornographic they're just kind of explanatory and it's a great book but anyway uh, the next minute was somewhat like the format of 90 Seconds on Sex. He never talked about sex on the next minute that no. I know of, but he talked about Next, NXT, yeah. which is a cryptocurrency. And NXT has, I, I'm actually a, a fan of it. Like, I think it's As pretty cool. It is different than Bitcoin and a lot of other altcoins because the code is entirely different. It's not just a copy of or an ape of Bitcoin's source right. code. It's actually written in Java. Yeah. And it's it's their own code. And they've got some cool things within Next, like there's the ability to do a basic primordial kind of distributed exchange. There's yep, secure they already have messaging. An asset exchange out there. It's not testnet. It's already out. Yeah. And you can send messages securely um, across the Next network. And so there's like a lot of things that a lot of people are talking about, but don't have implemented yet mm-hmm. that are actually working and available now in Next. It's true. So Chris wrote us this email about why, like... He first he wrote us an email that said, you know, I heard you guys talking about the Bitcoin community. I really like the next community for these reasons. And I said, well, can you elaborate on the reasons? And so he he did. Um, And I just thought this was kind of like an interesting look into an alternative kind of community or 
an altcoin, if you will, community. Sure. I, I even hesitate to call it an altcoin because it's somewhere between like a 2.0, a Bitcoin 2.0 kind of technology. Yeah, and, I think it's definitely a 2.0 technology. Yeah. And like, we're not trying to just like shamelessly plug Next or anything like that with this email. I just think it's an interesting glimpse into a s- sort of different type of community structure. And you'll see what I mean by that. So Chris says, he says, from next early days, it has been navigating with a compass instead of a map. The first alignments of the needle on the compass (laughs) began to appear in the epic Bitcoin talk announcement thread for the crypto, which grew to 2,500 pages before finally being locked with the crypt, with the conversation moved to nextforum.org. And one of the reasons why people on the outside felt that next first steps were not non-committal was because the company the community was dedicated from the beginning and almost to a fault to decentralization. Mm. In my opinion, he says, the architecture of the software seeded this. BC Next designed a brain wallet that could not have, b- sorry. BC could, Next is the creator of Next, apparently. He's yes, kind of the Satoshi the Nakamoto. The Next Toshi. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> BC Next designed a brain wallet that could, but did not have to, implement the same style of wallet.dat format used by other cryptocurrencies. He included a very basic reference client and stated from the beginning that it was intended to be removed once better clients were built by other people. He hinted at a wide range of features for the currency and suggested starting points for many of them, but intentionally left them unfinished. Brilliantly, he and his lead coder injected three flaws into the first source code release with bounties attached for finding them, not to trap copycats, but to encourage people to pick through the code looking for bugs and errors. So they, they purposely put bugs in the code and put out a bounty for finding the bugs to encourage people to audit the code and look at it and find potentially other bugs. That's incredible. I, I hope that's not just a, a crafty story, but no, I, I could believe it. And in fact, I've like heard that one, story from yeah, more than one person. One of the guys that I think actually found some of that, those bugs, uh, I mean, is as serious as a heart attack. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think that's a, that's an interesting trick to do. I like that. Yeah. Uh, so Chris goes on, most, most importantly, he, BC Next, abandoned the idea of quote, tweaking Bitcoin code and decided to forge an entirely new path, a choice that continues to haunt us as existing services realize they can't they can't implement next like they can every other Bitcoin based altcoin. Yeah. So on exchanges, next is actually a real problem because sometimes they have to process withdrawals manually and stuff like that. (laughs) It just doesn't fit in with their system. It's totally outside. But it is on BTER, Cripsy, some of the big ones. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, before he disappeared, because BC Next like rode off into the sunset and said, yeah, the I'm out, of see you later. Yeah. <laughs> before he disappeared, BC Next communicated through Come From Beyond on Bitcoin Talk. Every feature, every priority, every algorithm was tossed into the forum for public discussion, debate, and occasional consensus. Page after page of opinion would pile up, occasionally clarifying, but often completely muddying the water. Forum polls were posted and to arrive at conclusions, and decisions were often made based on the results of those polls. In this way, some debates were resolved quickly, but other ones, like the fundamental debate about how Next should implement its own voting system, raged on for months and never really got to a resolution. People occasionally demanded, quote, leadership and, quote, organization, but the community continually refused, claiming that any such formal structure would take us away from true decentralization. Which is my number one complaint about Bitcoin is the centralization and the leadership that people are looking for is crap. Like the Bitcoin Foundation is Mm. one of the great evils on planet Earth. Mm. I think this is really... His email is so fascinating because it shows what happens when people actually have as a principle, no, we we really are committed to total decentralization in our community, in our decision-making process. They're making decisions almost by consensus, which sometimes they don't arrive at, but that's fine because then nothing gets changed, right? Yeah, absolutely. And they only really want to move forward with something when there's actually a, a... a genuine consensus. Yeah, and decentralization is really the very, in my opinion, this is kind of meta, but it's the very heart of evolution, like of how things, you know, get enhanced and 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 grow is through is through actual real decentralization. Mm. You know, not central planning. Oh yeah, not central planning. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but yeah, central planning does sometimes creep into some of these altcoins. People are like, oh yeah, it would just be better if I could be get in control and do my. Th-. It's really a microcosm for like governmental structures, you know. Because yeah. with Bitcoin, you you almost see some of this like representative democracy. It's like people say, oh well, if you have a suggestion for Bitcoin, then just join the developers mailing list and p- pitch it to them and see if they'll do it. And it's almost like you're lobbying Congress or your representatives yeah. or something. And like nobody can under. I can't understand the Bitcoin developers mailing list. I'm not going to 
do well, that. I, <laughs> yeah, it just comes down to hierarchies or hierarchies. Mm-hmm. You either think those are good things or they're not. Yeah. And I'm of the opinion that they're not good things. Yeah. Whereas Next was kind of going with this dis- with this consensus model, almost like Occupy Wall Street, like they had a lot of decision making by consensus, which means everybody has to say, yes, I want this. And right. y- you talk until you get to a point where everybody's saying, yes, I want to do this. Right. And they did that online through a forum, which most of these people probably never even knew each other. So I just think it's fascinating. Anyway, going on with um, Chris's email, th- this utter commitment to no central authority did hurt us. Seven clients were (laughs) developed by different people, but they were not synchronized with developments in the core and they were not released according to any form of plan, making marketing and promotion a nightmare. At one point, Next is a quote, Next is so decentralized meme cropped up with statements like Next is so decentralized that we can't even get one guy on a plane after we were unable to get anyone to attend to attend an altcoin panel in Miami. And Next is so decentralized that we can't even write a white paper. The white (laughs) paper is still not finished, by the way. (laughs) <laughs> but the code is open source now. That was an, yeah. that was an early critique was that Next was closed source. That yeah. is no longer true. Right. Yeah. I, and really, like, I don't know. How important is a white paper, really? I think oh, a it's lot not. Of people, Most white papers are crap. I think a lot of people want to believe that the white paper that they've spent all this time writing is going to be read by a lot of people and is right. going to be seminal and important. But a lot of them are just blog posts. Yeah, that's <laughs> They're not yeah, really that's that important. all the time. <laughs> Last great white paper I read was, I think, uh, Dan Larimer's DPOS was fantastic. DPOS. So, that sounds Yeah, distributed uh, proof of stake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, DPOS. I love it. <laughs> Over time, loose structures, uh, Chris says, began to form that attempted to moderate full decentralization with some form of structure. As an example, the top-level domain, nextcrypto.org, was created, but most people do not know that all of its member sites, nextcrypto.org, charts.nextcrypto.org, blocks nextcrypto.org, wiki, etc., etc., are run independently on totally different servers by totally different people. Logos, marketing materials, and slogans were arrived at by conducting many, many rounds of voting on proposals submitted by people all over the world. After a fund of 9 million unclaimed coins from the Genesis block were put up for grabs, the community decided to create three communities, one for technical development, one for infrastructure, and one for marketing, who would steward and distribute coins for projects. Clever. Yeah, it's fascinating. Elections were held over a period of weeks, and now each committee is made up of five community members who accept applications for funding, debate them, vote on them, and then approve projects. Trusted initial stakeholders who are not on the committees hold the private keys for those funds and disperse them only when committees arrive at decisions. Now, that's really interesting. I'd like... That sounds like a process that could be blockchainized potentially, but Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how you do it. So they're kind of going about a little bit of a little bit of a democratic model there i want to say or there there's at least some trust involved they say like trusted stakeholders who are not on the committees hold the private keys um so that's kind of interesting right um they're handling a problem that well i mean can they do it any worse than mount gox (laughs) no (laughs) (laughs) i mean come on no and they seem to be doing fine with it i mean it sounds like that's pretty much working out for them sure anyway at first the committees just approved project applications now in part based on solid advice from adam b levine program director of the let's talk bitcoin network we love you adam (laughs) (laughs) the committees are arc architecting bounty funds that encourage the creation of applications, tools, core projects, wiki wiki content, marketing materials, and more by setting aside funds to support those initiatives without being prescriptive about what forms those initiatives take. That's so interesting. So they, they don't say what we want you to do. The committees don't say, we want you to do this this way, and here's the roadmap. They say, we want to accomplish this goal. You get there any way you want, and if you do it well, you'll get a prize. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, bounties. I mean, that's good stuff. For example, he says, we recently implemented a series of speakers bounties, almost exactly as proposed by Adam B. Levine, but shied away from any terminology that suggested the committee the committee could, quote, pi- prioritize topics. People just submit their work once it's finished, and the content is evaluated by a committee again on its own merits when funds are to be awarded. The funding idea, sorry, the founding idea is that we have to admit that we are not authorities who know everything in order to allow the contribution of brilliant ideas that we or any other central authority wouldn't think of. That's great. I agree. We have to admit that we're brilliant minds that don't know everything in order to let the good ideas flow that a central planner could not come up with. 
come up with. Ima- and I couldn't agree more. Yeah, imagine a little bit of humility. I mean, <laughs> awesome. Mm. So, yeah, I love the attitude that I'm hearing here. Mm. I love the process. And and it, look, if there's parts of the process that don't work, hey, we're you know we're moving forward here. You, mm. you know what I mean? As as a uh, uh, you know the the crypto coin or the cryptocurrency space, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know that's the beauty of these alternatives to Bitcoin is that we get to try all these different things. And that's why, boy, I get it. Just reminds me so much of how annoying it is when people are saying, ah, forget all these uh, alts, forget Bitcoin 2.0, we'll just do it in Bitcoin. <laughs> and it's like, wow, what a go- what a golden opportunity you're missing yeah to really flesh these things out mm. and put money on the line so that you know that it works because next has value in fact just the past week uh it had a really nice rise it did yeah um and you know maybe the the price is not as important as like the status of what's going on in the community but i like people might not be aware of this whole process of like how next has gotten it's six months old uh, yeah, so yeah, which is amazing. The last six months of history, people might not be aware of, but I just think it's a fascinating glimpse into this world of what happens when you uh, when you are really committed, when a whole community is really committed to total decentralization. And he admits that there are faults to it too, that that it hurt them in some ways, and that it's helped them a lot in other ways. So he says, there's a little bit more to the email. He says, this is where. Um, six months of true decentralization has gotten us as of now. A decentralized Next is a decentralized asset exchange that has already fostered standard IPO style offerings, as well as tipping tokens called I Thank You and Love, a, <laughs> a crowdfunded oil painting, and the creation of a film studio. The replacement of the old web client with a gorgeous new web interface that was built by a community member, enhanced by other community members, and is about to be rebranded based on the colors and logos that were voted on by still other community members. Distributed teams working on promotional videos with animations created in the Baltic states, copywritten in Britain, and voice work from Canada, and conference attendance, including a current drive to get to London Pay Expo 2014 that has created a whole sub-forum full of planning topics and is involving people from all over Europe. A cottage-style industry sorry, a cottage industry of developers working independently on multi-sig crypto gateways, an instant asset asset exchange, an Ethereum-style scripting layer, a decentralized poker game, and yes, even a couple of, quote, old world centralized services like exchanges. So this is what ha- it has gotten, and there's just so much creativity yeah. in that space. Yeah, and and I think I think this is showing the positives of decentralization, not the faults. And even the faults, I would wonder if I appreciate what he's saying, but even the faults, I would wonder if there was just if they were done a little bit of a different way mm. that they wouldn't have been wouldn't have been faults, mm. you know. Uh, but we don't know what those are, and we don't know till we try. And and they are trying, and they are trying their asses off. Yeah, and kudos to them. I love it. Uh, I've been uh, there's I'm, a little bit more. Yeah, wanna, please go ahead. So he and he does kind of address what you were just saying here. Uh, it is a hard road. He says, one that is frustrating for people who are being forced to give up their traditional feelings of leadership and direction, in quotes. This frustration still flares up in occasional but spectacular displays of anger over perceived disorganization, ineptness, and stupidity. Over time, though, we are all beginning to learn that the trick to success is collaborating over opportunities without getting too passionate or addicted to specific outcomes. Profiteers and centralizers are still in the picture, but their voices are generally drowned out by a larger community in favor of decentralization and collaboration. Could it eventually be co-opted as you feel Bitcoin has been? Sure. I can't def- I can't demand a specific outcome as more than anyone else can, but I think that this round of Crypto 2.0 is much further along than the last one and maybe BC Next next project, the one that is being released under his own name, will be even further. Society wins either way. That's probably way more detail than you wanted, but there you have it. Cheers, Chris. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad to hear that. All of that was important. It needed to be said. It yeah. needed to be out there. Uh, I'm glad. Chris, we thank were... you for taking the time to write that. I Absolutely. really am pleased to share it with the listeners. Yeah, I'm I think honored it's just... to be the venue that that message got out on. Yeah, that's, that's a very, very cool story. So anyway, Brian, did you have any more comments about this? You were going to say something. Oh uh, no, I just wanted to say. I mean, I'm I'm just a huge fan of of Next uh, for my own show, Sovereign Tech. I've accepted Next pretty much almost since its inception mm. for months. Yeah, uh, because I saw the absolute potential, and I'm glad to see that uh, my my visionary skills have not been wasted yet. Mm. Where is it going to be in another six months? Oh, That's what I'm who, curious about. I can only imagine. I mean, <laughs> it's, because it's moving so fast. they're doing the Steve Jobs thing where, you know, real artists ship, uh-huh. they're getting it out there. Yeah, totally. Awesome. 
Now, Brian, we do try to, uh, we're trying to get through our load of listener emails here on Sex and Science load. Hour. It's a big load, but somebody's got to take it. That's you know, right. <laughs> <laughs> it might as well be you and me. <laughs> <laughs> that will be a first. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, if you want to email us, you can do so at show at sexandsciencehour.com. Contribute to our show. Get your thoughts on the air. Maybe. I mean, we don't read every single email, but uh, we we do try to get to a lot of them, because pretty much all of them have something interesting to say. Sure. So um, we've got a couple more just before we wrap up the show here, because I know we're short on time, but I did want to read these two that I had planned for today. Uh, one is about your favorite topic, Brian. Sex? Driverless cars. Oh, oh, geez. <laughs> so, uh, and by the way, I think we, we had sort of a correction on that, huh? Somewhat of a correction. Yeah, you're... We didn't, we didn't point out uh, the, the work that Volvo has done in the driverless car world, did we? Yeah, and, well, not only that, your your father actually <laughs> made the correction. Um, and yeah, Volvo has been way ahead of the curve. Yeah, they've been kind of, of studying things. it for like 20 years. They study insects and stuff to see how they communicate, to like apply that to car yeah, technology yeah, and stuff. Yeah, it's really an amazing car company, one of the best in the world, easy. Uh, and also the idea that I agree, he's, he said that computers, uh, or that... Cars without computers could not do emissions control, mm -hmm. and I totally agree with that. Of course, do I think that emissions control is necessary and good? Mm -hmm. That's another question. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, yeah, in the current form, it's probably mostly just imposed top-down from governments. Would that exist in a free market? I mean, I think people want to live in a world with clean air. Oh, for the record, I am a I'm a huge supporter of environmentalism. So, but mm -hmm. I, I'm just, yeah. Anyway, I'm just going to leave that open ended. <laughs> All right. So uh, maybe you can email us if you want to hear more about that. But we've got an email here. What would your opinion be on computers, whatever complexity in cars, if there was something you could service, if it was something you could service yourself, if the code was open source? Uh, then I may not have ha I may not have so much of an issue. Uh, I mean, if I was a real performance hog like I used to be, uh, I do still question whether or not like my my foot not doing a lot of the direct control of things uh, wouldn't wouldn't be an issue. You know, uh, mm -hmm. but e e if it was open source, maybe. But then you're still there's security issues with because one of my big issues with this was that Android devices could hack you know, could crack into uh, car computers and yeah. control the car. Yeah. And so, you know, then I just, I still feel that even if it was open source, we'd run into an issue of security that mm -hmm. just wouldn't be necessary, mm -hmm. you know? And then, and, and I mean, Google's even putting in, talk about scary algorithms real quick. Google's even implementing, they're putting in this, like uh, this idea, or at least they're talking about doing this to where if your car crashing and you dying inside of it saves the lives of three people, say, to the left or right or in front of you or whatever, you're dead. And That's go very utilitarian, isn't oh, it? Yeah, okay. And, and that algorithm is going to choose that. Worst case scenario, is that ever going to happen? Hell, I don't know. But the point is, is that they think that they think that's okay, and that's nuts. Wow, that's nuts. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let the chips fall where they may, folks. <laughs> yeah, I can't. Wow, uh, that freaks me out too. Honestly, yeah, and, and they took the steering wheel out. It's not like you're going to be able to have control of these things. Google just yeah. recently took the steering wheel out of their driverless car. Didn't they claim that like, well, we did a bunch of tests and people never went for the steering wheel anyway. They just talked to the car. Yeah, they said as soon as people realized they didn't have to do something, they didn't do it. They said humans are lazy. Man, I, I don't. I... You know, I'm not going to say sheeple or anything here, but I just, I, I, wow, really. People just gave up that much control to the car. Yeah, I can almost believe it because I think most people do like what they're told to like and do what they're told to do, mm. it seems. Well, we try not to do that. We try. We don't not like to. anything. We're just grumps. Yeah, just well, that's right. <laughs> Curmudgeon corner. <laughs> anyway, the uh, emailer continues also a point about ABS. In most cases, the brakes are still directly controlled. There are just add ons that are computer controlled. The brakes will work with no electrical power. What's your opinion on systems like this? Combined with the first question, could this mean that you could have full control turning off the computer systems when you want or enabling the safety slash convenience features at your discretion? Uh, I mean, ABS works really well for what it does, you know, and so if there is a way to implement that better, you know, or where you have more direct control, of course, I'd support that. Mm -hmm. um, but also at the same time, I... Uh, I think he's found a good compromise that I would feel more comfortable yeah with. i'd be more comfortable with it with the open source all that stuff i mean i'm not saying 
you know, I don't have necessarily have that need for security, but you know, we're, I'm not the average person, mm. you know, that like the, the, the security with open sourceness and, and all that stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's intriguing, but I'd still prefer to have, you know, as much direct control as possible and far more easy repair for mm. my own vehicles. Well, thanks for the email and yeah, on, to our, ideas. on to our last comment here uh, regarding the, th- this person says regarding the man-made diamonds versus gold. This is something that we talked about a couple weeks ago too. Oh yeah. This was like a comment on one of the blog posts. Okay. Um, Regarding the man-made uh, difference between man-made diamonds and gold, the difference is the basic difference between diamonds and gold. Diamonds are an allotrope of carbon, a common and valuable element. It's their form that's important, not what they're made out of. Gold is gold. It doesn't have allotropes that I'm aware of. Its value is in its scarcity. Can you tell the difference between an artificial diamond and a, quote, real or natural diamond? Oh, sorry. You, he says you can tell the difference between an artificial diamond and a, quote, real or natural diamond. You can't tell the difference between gold mined out of the ground and gold produced by the uh, bacteria that we were discussing because we we talked about a science article where there's a species of bacteria that can turn gold chloride, which is a salt, mm-hmm. into uh, gold. Into real gold yeah, metal. Serious stuff. Yeah. Uh, And then he says, you can't tell the difference between gold mined out of the ground and gold produced by the reaction you're describing. That's why this development could destabilize the price of gold. Sure. I I think that's that's entirely possible. Mm. So, I mean, you know, gold is kind of the ultimate uh, pre-mine. And and, and that's uh, (laughs) the ultimate (laughs) pre-mine. Describe that a little bit more. Well, I mean, it's already there. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, so many people complain. It's like, oh, you're pre-mining. You mean there's going to be stuff beforehand that we don't have access to? Yeah, well, that's how it is with gold, folks. Mm. Um, it's all over the place, and you don't have access to it. Mm. Uh, so yeah, so it's kind of the ultimate pre-mine, and this is sort of you know this this uh, what what can turn something into gold, the gold chloride. Uh, yeah, I mean that 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 can create a, a real issue, I suppose. Um, I mean, the the diamonds thing. I'm more interested in the idea of the the old economic problem of water and diamonds. You don't need diamonds to live. You need water to live, but water is cost practically nothing, and diamonds cost practically everything. Mm-hmm. You know, or and your priorities it. would change if you were thirsty. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and so that's really my more my concern on diamonds is that I think they have a skewed perception of value. Mm. All right. Well, thank you so much for the comments and the emails. Keep them coming. Show at sexandsciencehour.com. We have really intelligent listeners. I love totally. Them. They I are. mean, dead serious. I know people say that sometimes, but no kidding. These people are intelligent. They have huge brains like me (laughs) (laughs) and thank you so much for tuning in today this has been sex and science hour and we'll see you hopefully next week maybe a week in a couple days but (laughs) we'll see you next week probably signing off you've just heard sex and science hour game over play again next week (laughs) 